forward, first and foremost, I would like to request Mr. Gavin McCormack, one of the versatile and hardworking educators from Australia, co-founder of Education Influence, to put forward his invaluable words and make a presentation. The forum is yours, Gavin. Hello, everybody. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good night to everybody around the world. It's clearly a global audience. I can see people from Gambia, Israel, Lebanon, California, India. This is uh, remarkable to be here. Before I begin, let me just say a huge, huge uh, thank you um, and take my hat off and tip it to Anoshi Shrestha. Um, she has worked tirelessly putting this together for one reason and one reason only, and that is so that um, educators around the world can share their wisdom and can spread the word, um, which is something which I think is missing in lots of education systems around the world. Teachers tend to keep all of their knowledge to themselves, but now we have this access to the amazing technology that we have to share our knowledge. This gives us the perfect way to be able to do that. So I'd like to uh, say thank you to Anusha. Well done to you. You've done an amazing job and let the next five days be absolutely successful i'm sure they will with you leading the charge okay so uh today i'd like to talk to you about the future of education and what that looks like in terms of our um let me just share my screen with you here we go yes hopefully you can all see that okay so let's get started without further ado Okay, so um, as you can see, um, today we'll be talking about uh, a subject very close to my heart. It takes a child to raise a village, and, and, and this is a, a twist on words. Basically, uh, we're trying to um, rethink what education looks like in terms of not looking at education from a top down, as Anusha said, the teacher dictating what children need to know. We're starting to think about education in a different way, which is where we look at our children to be the guide, to tell us where to go next, what to do next and how to learn. And uh, the reason that I have chosen this picture as my opening picture is because as you can see, there's a lot of learning taking place, but there is not a teacher in sight. And as educators, that is what we should be looking for. It takes a child to raise a village. The first thing to say is as a Montessori teacher that we need to model the behavior we wish to view in the children around us. If we are going to try to expect our children to be good citizens, to be hardworking, to be empathetic, to be loving, caring and considerate, then as educators and as adults, we need to model that ourselves. The old rhetoric of do as I say, not as I do, is dead in the water and we know it doesn't work. So how can school leaders and the people who work in schools include their whole community to allow children to truly taste the fruits of their labor? And this is what it's all about, allowing our students to achieve something greater than a point, a score, a percentage or a grade, where they get to actually feel that they've done some work and that work has made the world a little bit better. And you see the boy in blue, his smile, that is what we're all about. That is why we're all teachers and that is why we do this job, because we want to see children smile just like that. So what happens when our students are given a task they're designed to make the world a better place? Well, in autumn 1937, there was a virus spreading around the world. No, it was not COVID, it was polio, which was a child killer. And this meant children could not go to school. It was too dangerous. They, were, they had to be engaged at home. And what happened was the BBC, they basically employed a series of teachers to teach over the radio. But the added thing that they had to do was they had to make it purposeful because to teach over the radio is almost impossible unless the children have a purpose and a reason and an intention as to why they are attending that given lesson. And what happened was a program that was supposed to be rolled out in just the UK spread like wildfire, hitting Madagascar, Morocco, Tunisia, even as far as Gambia in Africa, where children came to school every single day via the radio. And this was all because learning suddenly became purposeful. So how important is it that our children have an emotional attachment to the topics that they learn? Well, take a look at this, and you may be feeling quite scared at the beginning, but this is homunculus. Homunculus is a model of a child invented in uh, the US by a, a group of researchers. It was designed to represent the cognitive impact on the organs in a child's body and how they react 
to the educational intellect of children. Now, as you can see by looking at this model, the hands are extremely large. And what that tells you is that our children need to touch. They need to touch and they need to feel. They need to be tactile in the classroom. The second thing to note is the size of the mouth and the tongue, telling you our students and our children need to have the ability to talk and to communicate in the class. But still, in many classrooms around the world, we're asking our students not to touch and not to move and certainly not to talk. And what we're actually doing is we're failing them. Because as you can see from this model, the hands and the mouth have the largest impact on the cognitive development of our children. You might notice how their ears are completely irrelevant, in fact, almost non-existent. But for 99% of the time in our schools, we stand at the front of the classroom and we talk and we expect our children to listen and then to learn. But what this model proves to us, and this is a world-renowned piece of research, is that when our lessons do not involve touch and do not involve communication, we are limiting the amount of growth, potential growth, that our students will experience. So how can we give our students agency when we deliver education with purpose? And there are some key aspects to this. Well, the first thing is to say that education needs to be a two-way street. It's not from the teacher dictating to the child, it's the teacher meeting the child halfway. This is what I know, what do you know? This is what I want to know, what would you like to know? Number two, it's about observing. We need to make time to observe our students so that we can see the skills they have rather than just assess them during the standardized test. We need to make sure the student is in the center of their learning so that we understand what gets them going, what their hook is, so we can build that into the education so they feel that every single day they're following their passion. We need to make sure that independence and confidence are part of the learning process. We need to make sure that mistakes are encouraged and a really good analogy is if you give a worksheet to a child and they get 100 percent, you have failed the child because there's nothing on that piece of paper that challenged them. There was nothing that was too hard and therefore we're not allowing them to think. We also need to make sure that our children are only competing against themselves, not against the other people in the classroom. We need to make sure that everyone's accountable. If something goes missing, if there's a problem in the room, it's not the children's fault, it's everyone's fault, including me as the teacher. When we have collective responsibility, then we have a collective movement in the classroom where everyone is responsible for everybody else's actions. We need to make sure that students have a voice and they also have clear direction. What do you want to say and where do you want to go? And the last thing to say is we need to make sure that we are focusing on the essential skills for life, not just grades, points, scores and percentages. So what do we want from the leaders of tomorrow? Right now, as you know, around the world, leadership is not looking so great. We have leaders around the world who are making bad decisions. We have wars, we have famine, we have droughts, we have global warming, we have more coal mines uh, going up in the world than we've ever seen before. And we know this is bad. So what do we want from the leaders of tomorrow? Well, we want leaders who know how to lead with empathy. Now, how do we do that? Well, we look at essential skills. Now, what I've put together for teachers here and around the world is something of great value, I believe. Here is a yearly calendar. Now, some of the biggest organizations around the planet are looking for key skills when it comes to education. They are not looking for grades, points, scores, percentages. They're looking for people who have skills to make their organizations become more advanced, more resilient, and be able to be more flexible in a very diverse and emerging world. So if you look at this uh, calendar I put together here, you have 40 of the top skills on the planet. Humility, compromise, independence, confidence, persuasion, motivation, public speaking, goal setting, team building, time management, environmental care, all of the things that our education system misses, but are actually very, very important in the formative years in our students. And we call these life skills. So what I've done for you, I've put together a document. It's a five page document that you can integrate into your schools. On the next page, I've developed a QR code. If you hold your phone up to your screens right now, this QR code will beam that document straight into your telephones. You can then send it by email to your coordinators or the people in your community, and you can then use it. This will allow your students and your schools to focus on these core cool skills. The document also tells them how to exactly do that. Now, while you're doing that, let me give you a little fact, an interesting statistic, that 
if you are in kindergarten today in 2022, that means that you will graduate from school in 2033. Now, you may think that you know what 2033 will look like. However, let me give you some perspective. That's 12 years away from now. 12 years ago, the iPhone had just been invented. Google Maps was a figment of someone's imagine, imagination, and there was not a Tesla electric car on the road. So this tells you that, yes, you might think you know what tomorrow is going to look like, but you don't. You don't know what the children will need academically, but there is one thing that you definitely do know, that the skills, those core essential skills we just spoke about, all the ones on this screen here, will never, ever go out of date. They will always be in demand. So use that and hopefully it helps you out. Now Montessori said that at some given moment it happens that the child becomes deeply interested in a piece of work. We see it in the expression on his face, his intense concentration, the devotion to the exercise. But how can we actually get this and how does it happen? Well, every child needs to feel that they have the ability to change the world. And this is very important because if we talk about purposeful education, what our students need to feel is that the work that they do in school, the work that they do in the class has the ability to change the world. Now, you might be thinking, why do I have an aeroplane on this slide? Well, I was actually walking through the forest with a group of children several years ago, and I saw an aeroplane in the distance. I stopped the class. And I told them, hey, everybody, look in the distance. It's a Lancaster bomber. One seven-year-old boy popped his hand up and told me, Kevin, that's not a Lancaster bomber. That's a C-19 Globemaster III. You can tell by the shapes of the engines, he said. Now, I had no idea how much knowledge he had about aeroplanes. But when I delved into it further, I realized that he knew everything that there was to know about World War II, World War I, the Korean War, the Falklands War. He was a war expert, but I had failed to understand because I hadn't given enough time to get to know him. I didn't know his hook. And my job as his teacher is to allow him to feel that he's coming to school every single day to be what he wants to be when he's older. And the quote that I use is, we don't ask our children what they want to be when they're older. We let them find out through experience. And that's about giving them freedom in your classroom. So as leaders of schools, as teachers, as educators, as heads of department, we must take our community on a journey with us. But what journey are we on personally? And I said this yesterday online to somebody, that if you want to be an inspirational teacher, you need to make sure that outside of the classroom, you are living an inspirational life. There is no point in spending all of your time, all of your days, even your holidays in your classroom, because you're not going to bring that inspiration into the room are not going to be inspired as a person and your children as very astute human beings can sense that. So you need to make sure that outside of school you have something that's driving you forward and you bring that into school with you. Now, several years ago, I visited a very, very small community called Noor Parasi in the south of Nepal on the Indian border. And in the bottom corner, you will see a small classroom that almost looks like a prison cell. This was home to a group of 30 children. And I met the teacher there and um, her name was Padma. And uh, I asked her what she was doing. She said this was her class. This was her classroom. But as you can see, there was no resources. There's no pencils, no tables, no nothing. So what did I do? I went back to my school and I told my students, this is what I want to achieve. I can't do it alone. I need your help. I need you to assist me with this. And several children decided they were going to help. They gathered materials. They gathered books, resources, pens, pencils from everywhere, every corner of their house they could find it. And they brought them to school. They packed them into suitcases. And what happened was, as a collective, we then decided to change the lives of some children on the other side of the world. It was the children in my class who did the work. I was just the bridge or the postman between what they wanted to achieve and what needed to be achieved. So once our children taste what it feels like to help others, that's the only thing they will want to do. So a group of children came into school and they donated some materials. You can see here there are some materials sitting in a suitcase and these children brought them in. And I took them to Nepal. And what happened was pure magic. That room that you saw at the very beginning for those children in the space of 48 hours was changed into a thriving classroom. And as you can see on the bottom right corner, it's now a very different space. And it didn't take much work. But what was very important is that when I came back to school, that I showed the children what they had done, what they had achieved through their hard work. 
And if you take a look at this picture here, that educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. And in the bottom right corner, what you'll see is a little boy and his first ever drawing, his first ever picture. And he drew a picture of his house. When I came back to school, I got those children together. I said, look what you have done. Because you gathered your materials, because you donated the things you didn't need, this boy in the bottom right corner has drawn his first ever picture. And those children said, you know what, Gavin? I want to do it again. Now, Gandhi said that you will never experience true happiness until you help somebody who can never pay you back. And this was one of those moments. And when we allow our students to follow their passion, to find their niche and to work with true intention and purpose, the essential skills that will set them up for life and taught not by us as the teachers, but through experience. And we call this the circle of learning. Now, when COVID arrived in 2020, the whole world changed. We were asked to reinvent the way that we taught children. Now, this was my school. I was the principal of Farmhouse Montessori School, a beautiful school on top of a mountain overlooking the ocean with a wonderful community. And when COVID arrived, I was asked to teach slightly differently. So I set up a camera, I had a system in place, and I did little lessons from my school every day, all day. In the evening, I went home and I read online for 100 days straight, and I called it Storytime with Gab. The amazing Anusha took over from me after that. She's now almost been reading for one whole year online. And this shows us that the power of technology allows us to teach in a much wider way. And what I realized at this point was there was something bigger than this. So me and a good friend of mine, Richard Mills, got together and we opened an organization called UpSchool. As you can see, we have a very big team around the world uh, with, with offices in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and at home here in Australia. And we decided that education should be free, it should be good quality, and it should go to every corner of the planet. So we arranged and organized UpSchool. Now, what happens at UpSchool is we deliver live lessons to schools all around the world every Wednesday morning. And they get beamed out to Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, Australia, and children tune in and I teach from my home. But better than that, courses are released and we have four courses going at the moment and they are very, very inspirational, allowing children to write a book and publish it, allowing children to take on the SDGs of the world and achieve them from the United Nations. And even better, in our final course, in our last course, which has just been released, um, we teach children live from the Arctic, bringing the wonders of the natural world right into your classroom completely free and amazing content giving your children a chance to change the world through education using technology as a wonderful tool now how do we make it purposeful well we partnered with some amazing organizations from around the world uh, jane goddard institute so they can rainforest rescue the john Fawcett foundation these organizations allow our children to do work and through their work make meaningful change through these organizations and see the fruits of their labor so for a child in India at the moment who wants to publish a book, when they publish a book, they choose an organization. And whenever their book is purchased around the world, some of the profits from that book are donated to a charity of their choice, meaning that they get the feeling that they have changed the world through their work. So courses such as Write a Book allow children to illustrate, plan, write, and publish their very own picture book, allowing them to write a story, not for a point, a score, a percentage, a grade, or a comment from their teacher, but it's allowing them to write a story that will actually change the world. We have schools in over 140 countries now actually engaging with our platform, and we would love to see you on that journey with us. Now, I want to share with you a very, very important story for me, a story which happened within my school and one which changed my perspective on what education can be. And I must stress before I tell you this story that it's very emotional and may make you cry. So you may need a tissue. But what I will tell you before I start is the most important part of this story is that the children were given freedom. freedom freedom to make mistakes, freedom to explore, freedom to take on any challenge they wish, but it was on their terms. And the important thing is this, that sometimes the things that count simply cannot be counted. Here are four girls 
from my school. We call them CAMP. This is the acronym for each of their names. They took on a challenge of taking on the world by doing something absolutely huge. And the first thing to say is that in their classroom, they were studying continents. They were looking at different continents around the world and they'd been researching Myanmar. And when they did, they discovered that the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar were being persecuted and they wanted to do something about it. So they came to my office and they presented to me their problem. They said, Gavin, we want to help some Rohingya Muslim refugees who are going to be arriving in Australia. And so we need to borrow some money. Now I couldn't lend them money, that wasn't within my, uh, within my powers, but I did tell them that there are many ways in which you can get the money. How much do you need? I said, they said, we need $500. And their plan was to buy a set of backpacks, send them home to the families, Ask families at home to fill them with all the things they didn't need, books, pens, pencils, shoes, hats, cagoules, sun cream, lunch boxes, dictionaries. And then when the, uh, when the refugees arrived, they would donate them and give them a wonderful start on their first day in school. So I told them, girls, I can't lend you the money, but there's many ways in which you can get it. So they decided they would have a bake sale. And the first thing they did is they got into school three very influential mums. They put together a PowerPoint presentation on their mission and they presented it to these three mums. So as you can see straight away, we've got persuasive devices, we've got time management, we've got speaking and listening, we've got confidence, it's all here. One of these mums left with a tear in her eye because she was so persuaded by the girl's mission and the girls got the, the three mums on their side. The next step was for me to organize the backpacks. So they raised the money, I bought the backpacks for them and they arrived. And I told the girls, be very careful when asking parents for donations because they'll give you all of their junk. You'll get all the things that they don't want. And the girls said, don't worry Gavin, we've made a checklist of the things that we will accept. And the next step was to get the parents to take these backpacks home and fill them up. So the girls set up a table outside of school and every single mom or dad who came to school to drop off their children, they spoke to them. Do you know what's happening in Myanmar? How would you feel if you were a refugee? And they got the parents to take them all 500 of the backpacks to their houses and fill them up with wonderful, wonderful things. Two weeks later, the backpacks arrived at school, all filled with the wonders that would make anybody happy on their first day at school. Now, the really important point is here is that I could have stopped the story here and said, well done girls, give me the backpacks, I will deliver them. But I told the girls, well done girls, you've got the backpacks and they're filled with the wonders that you wanted, but they're still 5,000 kilometers away from where they need to be. How are you going to get them to the people who need them? And the girls said, Gavin, can we use your telephone? So the girls came to my office and they called the CEO of two organizations, the House of Sakina and the Muslim Brotherhood Foundation. And they invited those people into school to interview them, to find out which organization they liked the most. And they chose the ladies on the right from the House of Sakina. Now, when I asked the girls, hey girls, why did you choose the House of Sakina? They said, Gavin, this is an organization run by women and we're women. So we want to support women in business. And who am I to argue being a man? So the next day, the bus arrived and the girls loaded the bags onto the bus and the, the bus drove away filled with all these wonders. Now I could stop the story here, but remember I told you about the circle of learning and that children need to be emotionally invested in anything that they learn. They need to see the fruits of their labor and they need to see that the hard work that they have done is having a positive impact on the world. Two weeks later, an email dropped into my inbox and the email said this, Dear Gavin, your girls have done a wonderful job click the video and try not to cry. So I'm going to show you this video now. Now on the left hand side, this is a group of children who had just arrived from overseas. They were refugees. They'd arrived in a country thinking nobody cared and no one knew about them. But little did they know that four girls in Sydney had been thinking about them for 10 weeks and preparing for their arrival. The backpacks were handed to them and I'll play the video now. So they arrived from another country, they'd 
come with nothing in their hands and when they arrive, a backpack is given to them, a lunchbox inside, a dictionary, a soft toy, a cuddly toy, even some sun cream to make sure you don't get sunburned while you're here in Australia. And as I showed this to the girls, they were standing behind me, I turned around and all four of the girls were crying. And I asked them, why are you crying? And they said, Gavin, we want to do it again. And my point at this point is that when we allow our children to do something that involves them following their passion and using their heart, there's no stopping them. And this is something very important, which is missing in lots of educational pedagogies around the world. Just look at how happy these children are. I'll stop the video there. So in order to access learning just like this, what I encourage you to do is scan the QR code on the right hand side. This will take you to the Upskill platform where you will find a series of courses, resources and everything you need to allow you to engage in learning just like this designed by us. On the platform you will find uh, parent resources, teacher resources, teaching programs, task cards, worksheets, but more importantly, learning material and courses that allow you and your school to give your whole educational philosophy and pedagogy purpose and meaning. And if you like what you see, do me a very big favor and share this with anybody you know, because everything on the platform is completely free of charge and always will be. So I'd like to thank you for listening to my talk and thank you for attending the conference today. I know that Anusha has done a lot of work um, to get this organized. And I thank you for listening carefully. Thank you so much, Kevin. And we do have one question from um, Dr. Happy Mashuku. Hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Her question is, the model is interesting and powerful, especially for the early grades, but it's tricky. How can I harmonize the curriculum based delivery, delivery which does not allow such interaction? Also taking into consideration that there is a syllabus I'm targeting to finish before national final examinations. Can I have time to apply big hands, mouth and tongue model? Look, it's a very interesting question. And I think that there's a lot of training needs to happen, but a lot of trust in schools too. Teachers are teachers and they are professionals. They should not be told how to teach. They should not be told when to teach. They should be told what to teach, but they should be able to teach it in their own way. And I think when teachers are allowed to use thematic learning in terms of bringing their own experience into the classroom and bonding two different curriculums together, we can literally do anything with the curriculum that's provided before us. But the most important question I think that needs to be asked in every classroom around the world is this one. When a child wants to do something saying, hey, uh, sir, can I make a poster? Sir, can I do this? The question is, you can do it if you can tell me how is it going to make the world a little bit better? And if the child tells you it's going to make the world a little bit better because of this, the answer is always yes, you can do it, which is very, very important. But also the teacher, when you are planning a lesson or preparing some kind of educational curriculum, in your mind, you always have to think, why am I teaching this to the children? How is this going to make the world a better place? If you're teaching it so they can get a grade, a point, a score or a percentage, you need to rethink it. There needs to be something in our educational curriculums that allows our children to have an emotional attachment to the work they do, but also allows the world to become a little bit better. Thank you, Gavin. I hope this answers Happy Masaku's question. Um, I do have another question from Dr. Pratima Khandelwal. How important is teachers of the same class collaborating with themselves for delivering and developing classrooms of today and tomorrow? I think in, in history, teachers have been um, uh, uh, hoarders. Teachers are labeled as hoarders. They like to keep everything to themselves and to collect all of these things and pile them up in the house and say, these are all my artifacts. I'm going to use them. But we, we know that if you want your children to collaborate, if you want the best of the best, you have to share. You have to be open to share your materials, your understanding, your philosophy and your thoughts. This is very important. I think some of the best teachers in the world, the best schools in the world have very open um, teaching platforms that allow teachers to communicate, share resources, share ideas and make sure that they're teaching across the curriculum with children moving between classrooms or teachers even moving between classrooms, because this allows your students to see that we're all in this together. 
and even the students and the teachers have an equal say in how things run. This is absolutely crucial and I think a, a very important question. Thank you so much, Kevin. Please, please register your queries at the chat box um, if you have any more questions for Gavin. And I do have a question for you as well, Gavin. <laughs> and my question is, most young children today experience xenophobic behavior around them. Uh, what do you think could be done so that children have respect for diversity and multiculturalism? Well, you know, we're living in a, Australia is the most multicultural country on the planet, apparently. I'm not sure if that statistic still stands, but it is. Children do not see race, they don't see creed, colour, they don't see that. It's something that they are taught. It's something that they learn. Uh, they pick it up from somewhere. Um, you know, we've seen many uh, research papers and evidence around this uh, that children just don't see it. They just see another human being. Our job is it's more important than ever right now in the world where we're seeing the far right, you know, rise in Europe and all over the world and all of this uh, division uh, take place that as adults, we model the behavior of inclusion. It's very important that we do that and, and that we expose our students using the curriculum and using our classrooms and using our pedagogy to the fact that, yes, people are different around the world, but that's what's beautiful about it. It would be terrible if we were all the same. And so celebrating the differences between us and the uniqueness of human beings is something that we need to model. We can't teach it. It's almost like trying to teach children how to be confident. You can't say to your children, hello, everybody. Today, we're going to learn about confidence. Well, now you're all confident. Off you go. Well done. You can't teach confidence. The only way you can be confident is by trying something that you couldn't do before, overcoming a hurdle and achieving it and going, wow, I can do it. Now I'm confident. You know, I've done a TED talk and I was standing behind the curtain and I was nervous. I was scared. I didn't think I could make it. And I did it. And after I did it, I felt so happy and I felt this achievement. And I felt like I was five years old again. And that's what our children feel. And they need to feel that. That, you know, it's too hard. I'm going to achieve something new. I'm going to be confident. And this is the same with anything, with xenophobia, with inclusion, with empathy, with compassion. We need to allow them to experience empathy to be empathetic, but as adults, they are watching us like a hawk and we need to model it. What we are, they will become. This is a fact. You know, if you want your children to read for a pleasure, you sit in the corner of your room and you read for pleasure and your children look at you and go, ooh, uh, miss is reading for pleasure. I'm going to read for pleasure. But if you say everybody's going to read for pleasure and I'm going to uh, go on my iPad in the corner and prepare my lesson, the children will say, well, the teacher's not modeling it, so I'm not going to do it. It's almost like a teacher saying, right, everybody, you need to talk with your beautiful, calm voices. But she's shouting at the children in the middle of the class. You know, you must use your quiet voices. Children, use your quiet voices. Well, the children say, well, you're not using your quiet voice. So why would I use my quiet voice? So you need to model it. They want you like a hawk. What you are, they will become. And this is the same with xenophobia, with inclusion, with anything. You need to model the behavior you wish to view in the people around you. I agree with Nisi Perlsi writes, being an example. I agree with that. And I do of have course. an additional question um, from Simon Panjay. Can this be assigned to an entire class or works better with small groups within the class? Um, well, look, um, if you're talking about up school, it works better with the entire school in actual fact, because the reality is that we want you should be collaborating across classrooms. Yes, it's a good idea to have collaboration in one room. It's even better to have collaboration across the school. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. When we say to children that very important question, what are you going to do with the knowledge you have just gained? We want to allow our students the freedom to say, I'm actually going to head down to kindergarten. So here's an example. A child comes to you and says, um, sir, I finished my model of a volcano. Do you like it? And the teacher says, I like it. But what are you going to do with it to make the world a bit better? And the child says, I'm actually heading down to the kindergarten now because I want to teach the younger children about volcanoes. Off you go. And this is where it works best. When the whole school is involved, every door is open and every question they ask you is, yes, you can do that. So if they want to head to the principal's office and interview him or her, they can. If they want to head to the principal's office and use the telephone, they can. If they want to head to kindergarten and do some teaching, they can. 
If they want to move seats, they can. They want to work on the floor, they can. They want to use the paints, you can. It's about freedom with limits. And once the children know what the limits are, then all the freedoms in between those limits allow them to really experiment and magic happens. So the answer to your question, it's a very good question, Simon, is it's very good as a group, it's really good as a class, but it's absolutely amazing if you approach it as an entire school. Also, Ashia adds, collaborative teaching with other subjects would be a better approach to learn other subjects more easily for the learners. How far would it benefit? Collaborative learning is obviously something that we want to uh, we want to make sure is taking place in our schools. There's no question about that. We want collaboration. And being a Montessori teacher myself, we have a mixed age classroom. So we have children who are, you know, in year six, year five and year four, all in the same room on purpose. And the beauty about that is when there is a child who is in year five, who is stuck on a maths task, they don't need to go to the teacher and disturb the teacher who's working one on one with a child. They can go to a year six child and say, hey, I think you know, you've had this lesson before. And the year six child says, yes, I have. Let me show you how to do it. And then the, the year five child says, wow, there's another 12 teachers in this room. I didn't realize, you know. And then as the child in year five goes into year six, they've learned from the year sixes that sharing their knowledge is part of being a student at this school. So it's built in as a modeled example that just runs like a river throughout your educational pedagogy. And I like Bina's question that says, is it possible for families who are involved in homeschooling to join up school? Yes, of course. In fact, the system is just going bonkers in the homeschooling community because te teachers are professionals. They are trained to teach and we should not question them as teachers. Just because we've been to school doesn't mean we know how to teach. You don't. You know, I've been to the doctors, but I can't prescribe medication. You know, I walked past an architect's office the other day, but I can't build a house. You know, and so we shouldn't question teachers on teaching. But when children are at home being homeschooled, one of the hardest parts of being a homeschool parent is the curriculum and what's required in the curriculum. Because that's what we learn as teachers, what we need to teach, when and why. And so what it does at Upschool is we put together a system that allows your parents who are doing homeschooling to teach from the platform and know that they are ticking all the boxes from the curriculum because they're built in and everything's provided for free. So for free. So thank you for that amazing question. That's really, really a nice question. Um, yes. Thank you, no Kevin. Problem, Bina. We have another question from Bina Kachwala. Is it possible for families who are involved in homeschooling join up school? Sorry, Anusha, I just answered that question. Is it possible for families who are... No, no, Anusha, I just answered that question. Oh, you just... <laughs> okay, um, yeah. if you have any more questions, please, please register yourself in the chat box. I think that's all the questions for me.